Joining us now to review some of the headlines of today's newspapers from around the world is Adefemi Akinsaya. Good morning. Good Adifemi. morning, Dr. Rubin. How are you doing? Morning. Good morning, morning Mumbai. Good morning, Rufai. Oh, Mumbai, Rufai, do you like it? <laughs> You're the second person <laughs> to do this. Today. I like to answer you. Okay, let's take a look at some newspapers. We'll start off uh, with the front cover of this day newspaper here in Nigeria. And the story that jumps out is the one that you all led with. Uh, with on the morning show today is looking at revamping of Nigeria's manufacturing sector. Now, Vice President uh, Shetima Lamar has talked about how he plans to or has already unveiled this five pillar roadmap into how Nigeria can restore or revitalize uh, its own manufacturing sector for the benefit of the country and the citizens therein. In addition to this unveiling of these ideas, you did have comments from Aliko Dangote, who is a manufacturer himself, a serial entrepreneur, and he talked about how the now 30% or close to 30% uh, interest rate is biting and making life very difficult for businesses like his own to, re to reach this type of potential we're talking about when it comes to looking at Nigeria's manufacturing sector. I do think that in theory, it's always easy to discuss roadmaps, unveil these different plans, but it's about how practice will be exercised, how difficult uh, or easy if, if you can even say that, it will be for Nigeria to um, be able to capitalize on its own resources looking at manufacturing. So that's the first cover of uh, this day. Moving on to the New Telegraph. They're looking at the decriminalization of non-use of NIN. You remember back in 2020, around December 2020, I went around Lagos. That was when uh, the, the information released to the public was that citizens had to link their SIM cards to their national identification numbers. And we did a report on how easy or difficult it would be to do that. And I faced some struggles in order to get that NIN and then link it to my mobile phone. So over the course of those four years, it's been interesting to see that it has been widely accepted by people across the country. But still, as it stands, there are some people who are having to deal with SIM cards that have been blocked who haven't uh, registered for the NIN yet. And what the federal government are looking at is taking this away from it being a criminal issue and perhaps turning this into a more of an administrative authority issue. So that is the plan they're looking at the front cover of the New Telegraph. If we now move on to the front cover of The, uh, of the Guardian, what they're looking at are how proposed Mergers are rattling MDAs, MDAs being ministries, developments and agency, departments and agencies. And essentially, in line with the revised Steve Aronsaya report, there is some discordance unsettling across the federal government as it pertains to some MDAs being uh, receiving notice of mergers, some receiving notice of relocations, or the winding up altogether. So that looks at some certain type of shakeup within the federal government and how people within the federal government are reacting to that. Lastly, looking at our last Nigerian paper, we'll take a look at the front cover of The Punch. And they're looking at cholera, how cases have now reached 2,000, at least 2,102 cases across 33 states in this uh, country. And they also talk about how uh, the National Youth Service have enforced strict, ca strict camp rules to keep corpus and the people that they will be in contact with safe. So those are the first bunch of Nigerian newspapers we're looking at. As I said yesterday, please feel free to look at this as a buffet and discuss what stories you'd like to jump out. Dr. Ruben, shall we start? Oh, OK. Maybe let's start with the national identification number. Two senators. Uh, Siri Fashi, Hikriti North, and Jimlin Barao, uh, Kano North, are saying that they are proposing that we should take a, a second look at the NIMSI Act, as it is otherwise called. And what is their grounds? That we have the challenge of identity theft. Uh, we need to expand inclusion uh, so that people will not be afraid as if they don't have NIN, then they will not be affected. The key point here is that the challenge, in my view, is not about amending the law. The NMC has how old is it? Now you want to amend it again, you know, uh, less than, okay, 10 years. It's uh, NMC Act of 2014. You want to amend it because of problems that have been observed in terms of its implementation. The true test of a law is in its implementation. 
We live in a country where people don't even have identity cards. In fact, there are people in this country who may not have birth certificates. There are people in this country who do not exist within the register because we don't have a data system, a reliable data system. I think the long-term objective is not about tinkering with the law. You can change the law. You can amend the NIMC Act uh, 20 times if you do not have the proper structure in place to ensure that you know uh, you have proper identity, you have data, and that the data are linked, and that people do not uh, suffer a lot of agony. You just talked about the problems that you know people have, you know, in terms of linking their NIN number to their uh, SIM cards. SIM cards. If you don't have it, then they will say, "Oh, you know, we'll push you out of the system." The same data that you will go to all extent to get yourself uh, properly captured, and some people will be retailing it on uh, social media or other platforms. So the problem is not really about the law. The problem is about the system that makes it impossible for the law to work. In other systems, if you're an American, you get a social security number, and you use it for the rest of your life. Yeah, it doesn't make you a criminal, but here in Nigeria, it's a problem. So it's about our society and the values that we prioritize and how the system functions. We run an inefficient system. That's where the major objective is. It's not in the details of uh, what uh, Jibrin Barau thinks is an omission in the law or what uh, Siri Fashui uh, thinks is an omission in the law. I mean, so one thing is certain. I think um, Elijah Liko Dangote has said it's ad nauseum. But I think what is most important is it's not just a talk by the vice president. We now need to be able to create something for the manufacturers because, you see, these are sectors that are dying away. Manufacturing used to be a very variable sector. Most of the debt in the manufacturing sector started pretty much in the late 70s and the 80s. The late 70s, when we started having problems with flooding our market with cheaper goods from alternative countries, and the 80s when the Naira slumped. We are facing that cycle again with manufacturing. And manufacturing is known to be able to mop up a lot of jobs. It provides a lot of jobs. There are a lot of people that are jobless. So it's not about the vice president just saying, oh, we now need to think of a roadmap. What are the quick things? Since last year, President Tinubu has been pro 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 uh, promising incentive, 9% interest rate for manufacturers. Are they getting it? Most of the manufacturing that's still going on in this country are mostly companies that are getting cheaper loans from abroad, from overseas, and bring them into the country. Oh, thank you. Talking about loans yeah. and manufacturing, just at the recently concluded AFREX and annual meetings in Barbados, we did have Nigeria's Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, and she signed a deal where they're looking at cotton and textile manufacturing, and she said that, that, would be, that those monies would be used to not only create jobs, but again, be some example of the development coming to Nigeria's manufacturing sector. I can't sector. wait for that to happen. You know why? The textile industry, <clears throat> is one of the biggest employers of labor in this country. Adam Soshomole, Senator Adam Soshomole, they came from those textile unions. But today, most of those textile sectors are dead. And all of these even segues, I refer you are my Ijebu sister. Yeah. What is it called? Ijebu land used to be known to have the big lace factory yes. in the 80s. Yes, Sokas My maternal grandfather, that was his yeah. business. Yeah. Sokas Damask. But what happened to those factories? They are all dead today. In Ayekwe, you had the Sokas that employed people. These were rural areas that had factories that had people working. All of that is all gone today. In Ijebu, day, you had Odutola tires, Odutola industries that employed people. All those factories not exist any longer today. So we must have a country where we have industry, even in the rural areas, so that we'll also stop this rural urban migration that is getting too much in this country. So we need to look inwards, and that's why we need to build industry. So it's not just talk, it's action. Because these businesses are dying, and people are reeling from the pain. Very quickly, before you move on to the next papers, cholera, I, I read a report, um, you know, yet to be confirmed, I believe it is confirmed that there's an outbreak as well at Kirikiri Prison um, wow. with about 25 inmates, I believe, wow. uh, who have been infected. Uh, 
This is the problem with cholera, is that if not quickly contained, it spreads quite quickly. Now, I know Lagos State have said that the number of cases being reported, apart from this incident at Kirikiri, that the number of incidents being reported has decreased, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the national case numbers are still increasing. And it just, you know, it just boils down to, it's rainy season, number one. It is. Number two, very few people, or a decreasing number of people have access to clean water because in most cases you have to buy it. Sure. There's a whole other conversation in, in itself. I'm exactly. gonna land on that point, <laughs> but we can't exist in a society where water, basic human need, clean water has to be bought. I'm with you, I'm with you with Bible. Let's take a look at some African newspapers. If we take a look at the front cover of Kenya's Daily Nation, they are again looking at the fallout, the aftermath of these protests. You can't even call it an aftermath because the protests are still ongoing, there's still demonstrations. And if you can take a look at that, you'll see that a, a gentleman has fallen, off of, um, uh, fallen to the ground. In the background, there's a motorcycle that has been caught alight. The story itself looks, about, looks, about, looks at six different people on police radar over youth demonstrations. And we've been saying this over the course of this week, last week, when these protests began since then, about how these issues mirror what we were seeing here in Lagos all of those years ago, looking at NSARS. And so to see that the police are now discussing that they find some people on their radar and they want to find out what involvement they had in these protests, it is on the one hand expected because you can you can understand that, that the police force in any country seeks to investigate what is happening. But if, uh, po if politicians, business people and NGOs are also under this radar, it is going to be quite interesting to see what that looks like. Um, moving on to Business Day South Africa, uh, they're looking at a tax, a 10% tax has been slapped on solar imports. And then finally, the Daily Graphic of Ghana, they are talking about finance too and about how the president has been uh, searching for debt relief to African countries, but definitely to Ghana itself. And we have been talking about the IMF's involvement in African countries and how taking money with one hand but not really having a stable plan on how to pay it back leads to the type of chaos we're seeing across the continent. So that's what we've got for African newspapers. I mean, it's a general problem, and I'm happy. This problem of jobs, I'm happy. President Ruto also enunciated that fact. You see, all the protests in Kenya is also can be tied to jobs. He enunciated that fact that you have about four million people armed with degrees but no jobs. Mm -hmm. He said he was trying to create a scheme for them and all of that. I don't know how that has worked out. In his over one hour interview he made. So there's a pervasive level of joblessness and that's why you're seeing all the things that are happening. But at the same time too, President Ruto too has not been honest. Because when he was confronted with the numbers as regards people that were killed, he said, no, they are not 24. He said there are 19 people that have been killed. He was quoting BBC over his own country's back National Human Rights Commission in Kenya, which I thought was an appalling one for President Ruto. I was quoting the BBC. When your Human Rights Commission is saying, okay, 24 people were killed, even more. And when he was asked the question about, oh, you are a parent, how do you feel about this? He was trying to sidestep it. So it speaks volumes of rising, and that's why you see the protests continued yesterday. Right. Because of that level of insensitivity. Most of the areas in CBD Nairobi, there was protests across the streets and everything yesterday. So the conversation is going on. He says in the coming days, he wants to see the young people and all of that. But I'm not sure the, those young people down the street are ready to see him. I also saw Raila Odinga. Anyway, it shouldn't yes. be political, but obviously it's not, it's not a fight between Kea Kwanzaa and Azimio. Top political parties. Because he's not doing what is right. And when you don't do what is right for the people, you're definitely going to face a backlash. And at the same time, he's fighting with his deputy president, Kagachawa, so which, which go, went out there Kenya. to condemn him Correct. and said, oh, people actually die. He took the side of the protesters. So he's in the dire street, but you have to figure out his problems one way or the other. But it segues into the same factors we're talking about in Nigeria. That's how a leader should wake up and do something. You, you know, when you look at 
Kenya, the, the recent developments are quite interesting because it, uh, to me, it points out what you see happening when politics gets involved in activism. So yesterday we saw Raila Odinga speak out. He's been notably quiet. And some people are saying, well, he's been quiet throughout this period because, you know, he wants to go for the AU chairperson job or chairman job. And he needs this government to back him and confirm yeah. his bid. And time is running out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Time is running out. And that bid is yet to be completed. So he's been notably silent. However, yesterday he came out and he said, when the finance bill was rejected and when President Ruto said, I concede, what he did is he accepted that there had been a vote of no confidence against him. And what he also did is he also accepted and took responsibility for those deaths of protesters that took place yesterday. Now, when you look at the front cover of the Daily Nation, and they are talking about six who are falling under the radar, the politicians and so forth, some of the conversation happening around Kenya right now is that, well, this is starting to give an air of sabotage. Now, why do people feel this way? This is because in the, uh, Kenya is not new to protests and a degree of instability. Kenya is used to uh, post-election violence. Now, one of the cases that became very popular was from Nairobi, when former Nairobi Governor Mike Sonko, at the time he was in the opposition, and he actually made a confession, and he said that in some of those post-election violence, um, post violence incidents, what they used to do is that they actually used to get their own vehicles right. and set them alight and set them on fire and make it seem as though the protesters were the ones who were turning violent wow. just to try and you know create a certain narrative so that's another conversation happening in Kenya right now where they're saying that well before he crossed over to uh, to the ruling party former governor Mike Sonko the former governor of Nairobi he has confessed uh, to some of the tactics that they used in trying to ensure that their protests were shall I call it quote-unquote effective so the situation in Kenya is really one to keep eyes on because like I said it's the unfortunate in uh, it's the unfortunate situation that transpires when politics gets involved in activism. Okay, I wrote an extensive piece on the situation in Kenya on uh, Tuesday in my back page column, at the risk of repeating myself. I think that the major task that President uh, Ruto faces is how to rebuild trust and confidence with the people. He came to power as a man who said he was a hostler. He was selling chicken by the roadside. <laughs> And then he made it all the way to become minister, member of parliament, president, and all of that. And he promised the people that he would defend their interests, only for him to turn around. Although what you say when you are campaigning is different from what you see when you get to power, which is part of the lesson that African leaders sh should learn. And now they see the same Ruto trying to impose taxes on the people. although. Kenya is indebted heavily, particularly to China, uh, over six billion uh, to China, bilateral you know, debt. But if you add bilateral debt to domestic uh, 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 debt, I mean, it's a lot. So he has to address that problem so that they don't go into a default with uh, IMF uh, that are lent their money and from where they are looking for credit financing. But the more urgent issue, is the conduct of President Hutu calling his own people criminals. And they humiliated him because they have refused to listen to him. They now say he must go. Now, on the specific issue of the people who have been investigated, the, uh, they have uh, an independent uh, policing authority in Kenya. That authority has commenced investigations. I, I think he's under the auspices. Uh, but President Ruto has again made the mistake of saying that he is satisfied with the conduct of the, uh, of the police. No, he cannot be satisfied with the conduct of Kenyan policemen who were shooting people and killing people and using live bullets the same way Nigerian policemen did in, uh, in the year 2020 with the NSAS protests. They, they have an independent national commission on human rights in Kenya. That National Commission on Human Rights in Kenya has said, look, more than 200, more than so, so number of people were killed. The president, who has not done any investigation, is arguing and saying, no, not many people died. Even if it was one person that died in the course of that uh, protest, President uh, uh, Ruto, 
he the self-acclaimed defender of the downtrodden, should be concerned. It's not for him to be arguing with uh, the people at the Human Rights Commission about the number of people that die. Should anybody, in fact, die under his, uh, his watch? As for uh, Raila Odinga, well, of course, Raila Odinga and uh, former President, uh, President uh, Kenyatta, wherever they are, they'll be laughing. They'll be telling Kenya people, I think we told you, now you can see the kind of person that he is. But I guess the bigger thing is for African leaders, African leaders generally, to learn from how you know uh, President Ruto has been uh, humiliated by a Gen Z, Gen uh, is it Gen X uh, generation in Kenya that says that like the youth of Nigeria, we will speak, we will sort of talk. Yes. As uh, Nigeria said. Plenty yes. Gen Z and Gen Alphas. They were the ones that, they were the ones that did the job. Plenty Gen Z and a, and a lot of exactly. Gen Alphas too mm -hmm. did that job. Well, all righty. I wonder if we have some time to look at uh, the New York Times. The front cover of the New York Times looks, the picture story looks at a, a deadly stampede that took place in India during a religious festival. Uh, many people have died. Absolutely a tragedy there, and the, the picture there is completely harrowing. Uh, so in addition to the New York Times, we're also taking a look at the front page of Daily Mail. We are just a day away from general elections in the United Kingdom, and it's safe to say that they are still, to the very last moment, trying their hardest to make sure and um, they, in question, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson Scott. and uh, Rishi, uh, Rishi Sunak Scott. joining forces, the they said that they are trying their hardest to stop what they're calling a Starmageddon. So they definitely think that come the end of this week, yeah. the new inhabitant of D uh, number 10 Downing Street will be K Sir Keir Starmer. After mm -hmm. tomorrow, it's going to be Keir Starmer. Oof. But my fear is this. When Labour came in the last time and they had this kind of push, when right. new Labour in 97, you had two very intelligent guys that had a hand on what the economy is. Gordon Bra and Tony Blair. Tony Blair. I fear the same. I fear that that will not be the case with right. Starmer. It's definitely not the same I think in three, four, five months' time, you will start saying Starmer is about the worst thing ever. Oof. Let's take a look. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your time. That's all I've got for you. Thank you very much. Uh,